what I, I find so often is that we put today's knowledge on tomorrow's future. Mm. And that's why I don't think your prediction of 200 is crazy. And that's why I don't think Vitalik's of 1,000 is crazy because in the year 1900, they assumed that they wouldn't have commercial flight for another 1,000 or 10,000 years is what the New York Times said in 1900. Mm. So it's like we're, we're terrible predictors of the future. Right. And one thing that I think you realize so well and you execute on is that all this is just made up. And the color pink I read today being something that's a girl's color. It's funny because in 1918, it was actually a men's color and it slowly became a women's color because wow. of Marilyn Monroe. I'll send you the link and I'll, wow. I'll put it in the show notes below. But it's just like all the stuff that we we are working with today is literally just... Yeah, it's a social construct. Social construct. construct, so much of it. And the ideas that we have too are that way as well. So my question to you is how do you take yourself out of the social construct that so many people find themselves in? Yeah. So the question is, how do you take yourself out of the social construct that so many people live inside? The book I would recommend reading is Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Nietzsche. So this book talks about this character who he calls the Ubermensch. Uh, Ubermensch in German is Superman. Um, and the Ubermensch, you know, he goes to a cave, spends a bunch of time by himself, reads, writes, reflects, and he does not take his values from society or his parents or the church or school or the pulpit. He derives them for himself or mm -hmm. herself. Why is that important? You can have the same values as everybody else around you. That's allowed. That's okay. <coughs> That's allowed. That's okay. But don't accept the value unless it clears your you know, reality check. Mm -hmm. And then you end up thinking from first principles about everything. And, you know, this idea of pink is a men's color, pink is a women's color. You go, well, why? Why? And so there are natural attributes to colors. For example, why is the middle of a flame blue or violet? Why is the sky blue? Hmm. It's because blue has the shortest wavelength and therefore it can, it can carry the most power. And the reason why the sky is blue is because, you know, when light refracts, and enters the atmosphere, blue has the shortest wavelength. Hmm. So it refracts the most. And it goes in a bunch of different directions and then it ends up coming at you when you look at the sky unrelated to the sun. Hmm. Um, and so th there are things that make sense with color, but there's no reason why pink should be a woman's color and not a man's color, right? My lips are pink, like it doesn't matter. Um, and, and so run through that filter every time that you consider a decision, every time you talk to somebody. Um, and so some people, you know, they'll read the Bible and make everything in the Bible is gospel. That's the reality that's real. And so it gives them, you know, unrealistic opinions around gay marriage, whatever mm -hmm. topic you want to choose. Well, when I was 14, I read the Bible back, back. When I was 14, I read the Bible cover to cover. You did. And I did it in Hebrew. Wow. And I did it with an audiobook. Not because I was religious. I mean, I am religious. I'm Jewish. But like, I don't live my life by religion. But so many people put so much stock by the Bible. I was like, well, I don't want your interpretation. I want my interpretation. So I just listened to the Bible. Yeah. I was the weird kid who rolled up to school in his car and the audiobook blasting in my speakers was the Bible in Hebrew. Wow. Well, Tanakh, Tanakh Nevi'im Ketuvim in the Nevi'im book, book, the book of Numbers, there's a whole section about how wearing clothes that have a mixture of cotton and other fabrics is like horrible. You can't do it. And so if you're going to uphold that the, a thing is true because it's in the Bible, you better not wear clothes that have a mixture of fabrics in them. But most clothes have a mixture of fabrics in them. Like there's all this random stuff. So like it doesn't make sense to pick and choose what you want to pick. Um, and that's the trick is like unless something makes sense and really makes sense, don't subscribe to it. And that's why I don't drink alcohol and why I don't smoke weed. It's because, you know, I observe that, you know, alcohol is liquid courage. It makes it e It gives you social lubrication. Well, before I went to college, I was like, well, I want to have that without alcohol. So I would go and I would lie down in the middle of a Starbucks or I would ask for a discount on my coffee or I'd go ask out every person I met in the mall. Like I built up my ability to not have social inhibition. So by the time I was in college, I didn't need it. And, you know, I'm the person dancing on every table at the party anyway. And, you know, in some ways, alcohol and getting yourself drunk is like momentary suicide. You're kind of getting rid of yourself of mm -hmm. what your normal brain is like because you can't handle the real world. Well, well I, I love my life. I love myself. I love my brain, even when it's sad, even if it's emotional, like I want to live through it. I don't want to take myself temporarily out of my existence. Um, I feel like I'm robbing myself. And 
there are many people who have a dif- different opinions. I, I also pick up on those opinions. I can recite them all back to you. Um, and I also know I have an addictive personality. I don't want to open the door to something that could derail my life. Mm. Right? I think of it as an existential threat. Um, and so I'm able to make a decision that is different, vehemently different than everybody else. And I do this throughout my life and everything that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the trick. Assess everything yourself. Now, here's a good way of how to assess things. I think about knowledge as what I think of as the tree of knowledge. Um, you have a base and the base, the trunk of this tree, you learn it from your parents in elementary school and middle school. You know, some of the upper echelon branches you learn in high school and then college expands it and society expands it. And when you read a book, it's like a leaf and you can put it on a, uh, a branch. But if you don't have any foliage in that area already, like when I, if I start talking to you, like when I listed the names of the Bible in Hebrew, can you recite? Of course you can't because you don't have any context. And so if you don't have context around the book, you will not remember anything from the book, even if you listen to it. Mm. This is why it's useful to re-listen to books multiple times sometimes mm. because you'll pick up the first, the second, the third thing, but the fourth thing you didn't pick up the first time. When I learned English, I listened to Harry Potter audiobooks 22 times in a row. I was 13, 14. Um, the first vocabulary word I had was Alohomora. And I knew what Snape was and I knew what Hogwarts was from Hebrew. Mm. And then little by little, I'd recognize like one or two words in a sentence. Then I'd listen again. I'd recognize two and then three. Like that's how I picked up the language. Um, and so you, you want to read, book, read books and here's the very fascinating thing that happens. Then you see some random YouTube video with a big thumbnail and title. Lizard people in the pizzeria embodying Hillary Clinton, whatever, or like doing whatever. You're like, wow, that's, does that make sense? Well, does it fit into the worldview of everything else that you've learned up until this point in your life? And that's the question you got to ask yourself. Mm. And I'll give you an example of something that didn't make sense to me. And like, you know, so you have your tree. Everything is connected in the tree. But sometimes you get new information and it's like a shrub growing, but it's not connected to the tree. Those shrubs are really, really dangerous. Don't allow other tree, other shrubs in your garden if they're not connected to the tree. So if you have a shrub, learn as much as you can. But until you have things connecting it back to the mental model of the universe you've got, you can't count them as real. Hmm. I'll give you an example. I listened to a lot of fantasy books. Many were, Vi- uh, some were about Vikings. I thought Vikings, I thought, I thought Vikings were mythical creatures. I thought Vikings were like Zeus. I thought Vikings were like fairies. I did not think think that Vikings existed. And then I went to Denmark and I spent a bunch of time in Copenhagen and I spent a bunch of time in, you know, Sweden. And I learned about King Bluetooth, who was King Bluetooth because he literally had a tooth that was blue and Bluetooth, the connection was after King Bluetooth and King Bluetooth was a Viking. Wow. And this person I was talking to in Denmark was telling me about this Viking King. And I was like, this is like a story, right? And they were like, no, he was actually a Viking. And I was like, are you serious? And they were like, yeah. Mind you, I was like 23. Like I should have known. And I was like, wait, when did Vikings live? And they were like, yeah, they're like 1,100, like 1,200, even, even you know, 1,400. Like, are you serious? And they're like, yeah. And then I, I looked it up and I was like, it was, it, was, it was even closer in the future. Like there were Vikings around like a couple hundred years before World War One. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Okay, so now Vikings, which I held in escrow, I didn't believe that they existed. Boom, they're now a real part of my tree. Someone corroborated that Vikings are real. I looked at Wikipedia. (laughs) There's a King Bluetooth. There's a person in Copenhagen, multiple ones of them that tell me they're descendants from Vikings. I started realizing like very interesting other things. So, and this is, I, I work a lot with dyslexia. There's a really high propensity of dyslexia in Australia, more than anywhere else in the world. And I couldn't figure out why. It's because the UK used to send people to Australia who were um, in prison. And you ended up in prison because school didn't work out for you, whatever. Well, you know who else has a high propensity of dyslexia? People in the Nordics. Um, And you know what Vikings would do? The people who were the most aggressive, the most ADHD, the most not liking school because they had dyslexia, they'd go rape and pillage. And you know where they'd go rape and pillage? In Scotland. And so there's a lot of Scottish people who also like have this demeanor in person. Like, when you start connecting all the dots in the world, it starts to make sense. And random pieces of history that you learned in the past start to connect to the business that you're working with now. And this is true for technology. It's true for financial systems. It's true for politics. It's true for, true for education. It's true for current events. It's true for everything. And so my benefit is I had a really solid tree of knowledge. I have two really wonderful parents. I had good teachers when I was young. I lived in Israel. I lived in the UK. I lived you know, in California. I got educated at Brown in you know, Providence, Rhode Island. And on top of that, I listen to 100 audiobooks every single year for the last 15 years. 
across everything, theology, philosophy, sci-fi, fantasy. And again, when you listen to a sci-fi or fantasy book, you have to like tell yourself, is this bullshit or is this not bullshit? Like what's real, what's not? Mm. Um, and so there's an amazing author, Dan Brown. I love this book when I was growing up. He writes fantastic thrillers like The Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code has some things that are real and some things that are not real. Mm. And it is a very interesting exercise to try and figure out what's real and what's not real in this book. Mm. And he's very good at telling you at the end of the book. Um, and so that's the trick. Build a tree of knowledge. The other way of thinking about it is a mental model of the universe. Think about Google Maps. You know, there's some sections you zoom in, it's super, super clear, like New York City, and some places that are very pixelated. And so in my mind, the section about, you know, text-to-speech, very clear, very unpixelated, but the section about, like, Bengali dance is, like, a little bit pixelated. Um, and so educate yourself about the sections that are not clear. But when you get a piece of information that doesn't make sense, you don't know where it is in the map. It could be in, in the moon. Don't believe it's true until there's corroborating evidence that make it clear that it is true. And that's how you make the distinction. Hmm. So that's so many fascinating ideas there. But one thing I'm curious about is in college, you would lay on the ground and you would just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Over and over and over again. That's right. Take me through the first principles thinking of the belief or knowing of God right. and how that is, if that's still the case, how, no, no, it's still the case. how, how you, what's going on there. Yeah, yeah you did your research. So, um, so let's go back. So I grew up in Israel. And everybody around me, for the most part, was Jewish. And when I moved to the States, I remember vividly there was a day, and this kid next to me, his name was Christian. And I was like, wow, yeah, I've never met a Christian before. Like, what's it like being Christian? Yeah, but I had an Israeli, I've never met a Christian before. What is it like being Christian? Um, and so he would tell me. I realized the other kid, he was also Christian. And I was like, whoa, there's two Christians in the class. Can you believe it? And, and I realized that like 80% of the class was Christian and 20% was like, you know, other stuff, but like 15% was Jewish. We happened to be in like Beverly Hills. Um, and only then did I realize that most of the world is not Jewish. Mm. I realized Jews were like 0.2% of the world population. And, you know, I grew up, like I would watch like the cartoons in Israel when I was growing up, like they were Bible stories. Like I know all the Bible stories, mm. um, but I'm a very scientific guy. And like, I never saw like, Show me proof, right? Um, especially in high school. And, you know, obviously I didn't see any clear proof. Oh my God, I'm going to tell you a story you're going to love in a second. Um, but I was like, okay, well, and then I got to college and I did not plan to go to Brown. I thought I would go to Stanford or Princeton or Harvard or MIT, places that I had heard about. I'd never heard about Brown in Israel. My parents didn't know what it was. And when I started applying to college, most kids apply to like six or eight schools. I applied to 26 schools because I figured that it's a lottery. Every school can get 10X qualified classes of kids. Um, and I was like, well, it's a lottery. Well, how do you win a lottery? You brute force it. So I brute forced it. I applied to 26 schools. I rewrote my Common App essay 28 times. Wow. Um, and I applied to every Ivy League, I think, except for Columbia. And I applied early to Dartmouth and I got deferred and I, I couldn't believe it. Like I, I was sure I'd get in. And then I didn't get in when I rolled around. I didn't get into Harvard and I didn't get in Stanford. By the way, even yet I applied to Stanford three more times after because like I was like, I just don't give up on this and stuff. Um, I didn't get in eventually. Um, and then I got into Brown and I was like, whoa, I had never even considered going to Brown. The only reason it was on, it was on the list was, it be, was because it was another Ivy school. I never even visited so I went and visited and everyone was smiling and people were interesting and interested. And it was the happiest place I think I'd ever been. And I went home and did more research. Turns out that Brown was ranked for eight years in a row, the happiest school in the world. Wow. Um, before 2016, sorry, before 2012 when I went there. So from 20, um, yeah, for like a long time. Um, and I was like, okay, this is my place. So I went there and three weeks in, I started noticing that my cheeks started hurt and it was because I was smiling so much all the time, constantly. It was literally the best experience anyone could have ever had. Like I thrived and I didn't even plan to go to this school. Mm. And I have many friends who've gone to many other schools. You know, I've done hackathons in all of them. I did pitch competitions in all of them. No one talks about their school the way I talked about Brown. There's only one school that I hear people talk about the way that Brown kids talk about Brown and it's Duke. Hmm. They're, they're the two schools I most consistently see people rave about. So I went to Brown and sometimes, you know, I'd be walking home at night and Brown has a lot of like very nice grassy patches of area. It's on a hill. 
And so there's not a lot of light pollution. Um, and so I lay down in the grass and I would look at the sky and I would think to myself how grateful I am to be here. And I think to myself, you know, how is it even possible that I got this lucky? And um, it reminded me of a Katy Perry song, back to music. Uh, maybe the reason why all the doors are closed is so that one can open that leads you to the perfect world. And I felt exactly like that. All the doors got closed on me, but the right one opened that I did not expect. I didn't think I was going to be there. And the universe just nudged me in the right direction. So if you don't like the word God, use the word universe. I believe in the universe. I believe there's a power out there. And I believe someone's watching over me. And uh, I live life as if I am the main character of my own story. And kind of like the universe revolves around me. And the, universe cares, the universe cares about me. It wants me to be happy. Um, and I looked at all the stars and I was like, wow, you know, it's amazing that Earth is just the right distance from the sun and that we have an atmosphere. And that allows for life. Like, that's nuts. No, one, no other planet has that that we know of. And it's amazing that at some point, there was enough heat and enough pressure at some cavern in the middle of the ocean that life started to exist. We don't even know how that happened. And that from there, that evolved into more things, and into fish, and into mammals, and, and, and apes, and humans. And there's reproduction systems. And I'm the sperm that got chosen? And then, like, I got these parents and these siblings, and, like, now my life is like this. Luck does not work like that. It's just not possible that I got this lucky. It's just, like, probabilistically, literally impossible. So there has to be something that is moving us in the right direction. I don't know if it's God. I don't know if it's the universe. I don't know if there's a giant chicken in the sky. But something is moving us in this direction. And there was a radio show. This is before podcasts I listened to. And it was talking about this very religious guy with his family. It was Friday night. There's a white tablecloth. The children are singing songs, laughing. There's candles. There's food. The wife is happy. And the guy has a heart attack. And he goes up to heaven. And he sees these big doors. And the doors open. And he's very excited. There's a big chair. And in the chair sits a giant chicken. What? I've been reading all these books. I've been praying every day. And it's just a giant chicken. And the chicken goes, bok, bok. And he's like, are you serious? It's just, it's been a chicken all this time. It's like, bok, bok. <laughs> and then he comes back and, he, and, 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 and he's back in his body and he sees the kids and he sees the wife and he remembers that vision that he had looking down at them, seeing the kids in the white dress and, and the tablecloth and the songs and the happiness and the wholesomeness. And he goes, do I tell him? Mm. And he decides not to tell them because it's a better life believing that there's someone out there for you. And because the principles that they follow led them to living a life that is more wholesome, that is more happy. And if you look at people who are religious, they are consistently more happy, more charitable, their families stay together, they live longer. Um, and so you don't need to be super religious. You don't need to be religious at all. But I think that if you have the opportunity to be a nihilist or an atheist, or to believe that the universe has got your back, mm. I'd recommend believing the universe has your back because you lose nothing and you gain everything. Um, I can't remember what the original question was. <laughs> it was about God. And it was about God. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I just feel grateful. Um, and then when I would lie on the grass, I would talk to God. I'd have a conversation and I would say the things that I'm grateful for. You know, thank you for my brother. Thank you for my dad, my mom, my sisters. Thank you for putting me in brown. Thank you for my brain. You know, I have a neurodiverse brain, but thank you for my brain. I wouldn't want to switch it for anything else. Thank you for my body. And some people, when they talk to God or a genie or whatever, they make wishes. They say all the things that they want. I used up all the time to just say thank you for all the things I have. But by the time I got to asking for things that I want, I never got to the things that I want. Mm -hmm. I had an unlimited things, number of things to say thank you for. And what I would often do is I would mix it with music. Um, if I felt down, you know, when I feel sad, I stop listening to, I listen to less podcasts and I call my mom more or I call my dad more or my brother or Valentine or another friend. But when I was a Brown, I would bicycle or longboard or pennyboard and I'd find a piano and I'd go play and I'd play songs and I'd sing and, you know, I'd commune with the universe. Um, and I'd think, and I do whatever, whatever you want to call it, meditate, pray, what have you. Um, and I'd think about, you know, how grateful I am. And I would write songs about it too. 
So this is another beautiful thing about music is I can communicate so much more powerfully from music than mm. I can just with my words. Mm. And if I count the number of times that I've cried over the last five years, probably 90% of them have been while writing a song. Writing. Writing. So I, and this is, I often write in planes. So I cry a lot on planes mm. because I succeed in pulling out the essence of my soul, the things that I can't digest without writing in a song. But if I write in a song, I can feel the feeling all the way through and, and it's strong. And for that reason, I succeed in getting other people to cry when I play those songs for them. Um, and many of those songs are not published, but you know, they, they hit the point that I'm trying to hit. What are some of the common themes amongst the songs that make you cry? Um, the most recent song I wrote was, it was my dad's birthday. And I wrote a song for his birthday. Um, and let me, let me pull it up. Uh, I love that. My phone is over there, so I'll do it on my computer. <laughs> yeah. Will you hold this for me for a Yeah, second? absolutely. It's funny because I feel like the most powerful moments in life are often moments when we're creating something. And it's from doing this podcast that I realize, oh, wow, what I'm really doing is creating a conversation in that this moment. And that's why it's so powerful. That's why I enjoy it. You got it up? I got it up. Um, it is in Hebrew because my dad's first language is Hebrew, but I'll do some you know translation for you. Um, um, dad's boy what do you dream about what is burning in your heart uh, it's, it's so good that you've come together it's whole um, and let me skip to like basically I, I surveyed all my siblings and I was like what are specific moments in your relationship with dad that were very meaningful to you mm. so for example my sister didn't want to apply to her master's and my dad believed in her and he told her, you're going to get in. You should apply. And she applied just because of him. And he, she, she got in. She did her master's in artificial intelligence at Stanford. Um, you know, my other sister had like a bunch of, you know, similar conflicts. And my dad always there for her, you know, for me with dyslexia and reading to me. And, you know, every single one of us, everybody has a struggle. Yeah. And my dad just like amazing at being there. And what he does is uh, he's an extreme night owl. He doesn't go to sleep. But if you call him, he will stay on the phone with you all night. Wow. Um, and so, for example, like my laptop got stolen one time when I was a brown or, you know, any, I'll be in like, oh, I flew to Ukraine in 20, 2018 okay. and it was under martial law when I got there. And so I called my dad and I was like, hey, should like, I like stay here? What should I do? It was like, well, you know, Israel is often under martial law, but only on the border. Are you going to the border with Crimea? And I was like, no, oh, you're fine. But like, and then I ended up in this taxi. <laughs> with no reception and I had to speak to the taxi driver in Russian, like, like, you know, uh, like, you know, Russian? Show, spasiba, like, like basic Russian, like the navigating this taxi driver. And I was like, this is where I potentially die. And like, but my dad is like, I know that he's tracking my location. Like, cause he knows that I'm here. He's like, you know, uh, Houston, we have a problem. He's like the support room at any point in time. And so there's a line here. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, Basically talking about, you know, my dad sitting for hours on the phone with us, like mm. having endless conversations and just caring for our well-being. And so, you know, I, I cried a ton when writing the song. And then I sent it for him for his birthday and, you know, everybody in the family cried. And I, I did a very similar uh, thing like this for, for my mom and my brother for talking about their relationship together. Um, I wrote a song about like how am ambitious I am and like the things how I want the world to see me as a, like how I see myself versus how the world sees me mm -mm. and how much I'm fighting to, to get to the point where the world sees me the way that I, I see myself. And by the way, I think this is a struggle that everybody goes through in their lives is you see yourself in one way and the world sees you in another way. And it's a huge struggle. It's a struggle of most people's, well, okay. The number one thing people want in my opinion in life is to be loved. Mm. That's what we want above everything else. And if you listen to this podcast and you're like, wow, like, Cliff seems so well adjusted. Like, what is the reason for this well adjustment? It's not the reading. It's not, I mean, that helps. He said, I had two parents growing up that gave me unconditional love. And when I failed in school, when I was bullied in school, when I was like very short, short and nerdy and everything else and didn't fit in, I knew that I had unconditional love at home. No matter what happened, I knew these people would care about me. I knew these people would love me. And I had my brother Tyler and my sister Geffen and my sister Alex and my brother Eric's. I had, my floor was so high mm -hmm. because I had these group of people that I can't lose. So you're playing with house money at that point. Like that's the most important thing. House money and the phone goes off. Uh, yeah. That was weird. <laughs>
So yeah, so you you just gotta um, yeah. So it's writing about those relationships. But and the second thing is this fight to have the world see you the way you see yourself. Mm. And so for me, you know, I have a big chip in my shoulder, and I'm trying to prove. And and for my. I have this fire in my chest and all this ambition. And if my chest would open, it would jump out and jump off the walls. Um, and it's been that way since I was five, four, the, the moment I can remember being a human. Um, and I've always believed I can do anything. Mm. And it's just a fight to make sure that everybody else believes the same thing about me. And I think at this point in my life, I've gotten there. And this is why the Hassan Minhaj, uh, the Hassan Minhaj uh, advice is so good because there's no point of me trying to show that I can do stuff at this point. I'm much more likable if I play the low status game mm. and then you put people at ease, you make people feel great. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really funny because I'm looking at you and I see two different things that are interweaving so nicely in that it does seem like you're at peace. And I think that's from being loved as a child and loved as an adult and you are so ambitious and it's rare you find that mix mm. of ambition and at peace mm. and to me it's a superpower i feel that personally as well mm. from my parents and i want to do incredible things but it's like most people don't have that they're missing either the ambition the work ethic or being at peace mm. and you've got it all so mm. like what what do you say to somebody who feels like they don't have one aspect of that yeah i think that's like 99.99999% of the world is very rare to find someone who is extremely ambitious and also very happy. Yes. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm at peace. Interesting. Um, Why not? I'm, I'm constantly moving. I'm constantly in motion. So there's a saying, you know, all the world's problems could go away if a man could sit in a room by himself. For 30 minutes. And I can't do that. No <laughs> way in hell. Um, well, I appreciate the self-awareness. Oh, absolutely. Um, I just, my mind needs the engagement. And if you think about it, like movies that came out in the past, like Gone with the Wind was the number one movie that's ever come out. And the speed of the movie is like, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> that speed. Dude, that movie would flop today. Because everybody is like trained by TikTok and Instagram yeah. and double speed YouTube, double speed Netflix, double speed WhatsApp videos, mm -hmm. double speed lecture capture, triple speed this podcast and your audio books. Um, it used to be the 60% of high school kids would read books for fun. Now it's less than 6%. Um, yeah, I've tried many times to kind of figure out meditation. It just doesn't work for me. Um, what's interesting is I have never experienced burnout. Most people I know have experienced burnout, and I have not. But it's because I have kind of pillars that I don't give up on, like exercise, music, time with loved ones, time with like physical love, um, and just like being good to people. And then those are the things that I've in like learning, like books. Those are the five things that I prioritize. And then after that comes the business and everything else. And you're also, when you're doing the business, it's something you love and is deep, yeah, deep at exactly. your core. Yeah, so yeah. it's like all fueling yeah. and you're going. When I, when I say that, it's going going to go up to go down. I don't mean that like it's going to be a burnout situation. I mean like an intentional, mm. like I made all this money, I built all these things. And I, yeah. just a prediction. Well, that's something that off. I always try to think about is like, all right, well, you know, we've had this level of success. Like, what do I do with it? Like, mm. how do I enjoy it more? Because like, I don't spend money on almost anything. Like, why? I live with my friends. Why? Um, why? Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I live with my friends. I don't buy many clothes. I, uh, you know, the main thing I spend money on is food hmm. and I don't go to restaurants. I mean food because I eat Chipotle because it has the highest like protein and calorie intake. Protein um, to price ratio. I don't care about the price ratio because like if you wanted the maximum amount of protein, you'd get like six chicken breasts at McDonald's, right. whatever it might be. Right. But like, that's not good for you. Um, it's, uh, it's protein to time ratio with good enough health quality. Um, and, but why don't I spend money? What is there to spend money on? Like the money won't help me. Um, if you look at the happiest people, it's not the people who are spending the most money. Um, it's people who have meaningful relationships typically. Um, and so that's what I want to spend time on. But I am running into the challenge of like, do I want to spend more time on my relationships than I do in the business? Well, no, because I really do. So it gets back to like the question, you know, ancient Greeks talk about eudaimonia, the good life. Um, and that's different than like happiness or bliss. Um, it's like more like self-actualization. And so I want to self-actualize. That is the thing I desire more than momentary bliss. And then luckily I figured out how to do that. Some people think that you need to sacrifice everything in order to be successful. And I completely don't agree with that. Uh, I think you can have your cake and eat it too. And that's what I'm always kind of working on is, is I'm enjoying my life along the way. Like this is a great journey. And the only things that I have done that I have enjoyed more 
is spending time with loved ones, spending time on music, spending time on parkour, listening to audiobooks. And I do those things, but I'd like to do them more. Like I'd like to spend more time on music. I'd like to spend more time on parkour. I'd like to spend more time with loved ones. I'd love to spend more time on fitness. Um, but a lot of my identity is tied to Speechify and it just, it requires a lot from you and I'll get it. And it's the thing I'm learning. Like, man, I started doing parkour when I was like six. I'm good at parkour. I've had relationships for a long time. I've been musical for a long time, but I've never given it the amount of energy it deserves. And so there will be a chapter of my life that's based on music. Mm. So that'll probably be the place where I slow down a little bit and I figure that stuff out and then I'll come back. Like, man, I'm so attracted to the idea of being able to do a freestyle rap that is two minutes long about any topic that is funny and clever and has a point of view um, and, and get as good at, ri- at writing as someone like Lynn Merle Miranda mm. or, or, you know, or Hassan Minaj, or any of these mm. people who, like, I listen to their writing, and I'm like, how did you come up with that? Yeah. And quickly, that is a craft that I want to I wanna crack. Like, that, that, that is so cool to me. What part of your identity do you feel like, in this moment, you need to give more love to? Uh, the parkour part. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so parkour, to me, is like video games. I don't play video games, but, like, you're standing on that ledge, and you're trying to figure out, can I do a gainer off of this thing? And you're afraid. And like, I know I can do the move. And I, I'm standing there for like five minutes, psyching myself out. I'll call my friend Matthew. I'll be like, Matthew, look, I'm trying to do this gainer. I can't get myself. Can you like give me a pep talk? Cliff, I've seen you do this. I've seen you do that. Stop being a, put my phone down, put this song on, wait for the drop and then just do it. And then I'll do it. And it feels amazing. Like it's, you're in the moment and every little motion matters. And it's like a video game, but for your body. And it's probably one of the only times in my life where I'm not thinking about the future. I'm thinking about just the now. Mm-hmm. Um, How dangerous is it? I mean, I've never been injured. The maximum, ah, the maximum I've been injured was twice. Once I did 200 backflips in a day and I pulled my left ab really bad and I couldn't train for like another three weeks. Uh, and the second one is I did a cork, which is like a, a flip where you kick your left leg above your shoulder and you do a flip in a 360. And I landed on my side instead of landing on my foot. And I like bruised my rib right before going to Hawaii and I was fine. Um, that's the maximum. Like I will not run. I'll, like, I'll run and jump between roofs, but like only the first story, never the second story. Okay. So if I fall, I'm fine. And I train on mats. So like it's, it's not that dangerous. We just got to protect this brain. That's all. <laughs> that's, that's how I think about it too. Yeah. I like it's not worth it to damage the brain. Um, but no, I, I love it. So that part of me deserves more love and the writing part and the music part. Um, and I think that, I just don't have a gymnastics gym close by here. Mm. Um, I need to prioritize them when I go to London. LA has an amazing one, so I always train around there. Um, and so I just need to spend more time with friends who are gymnasts. Uh, I had an ama- I have an amazing friend, Nick Hunter. Uh, shout out Nick, who lives in Palo Alto, who was the captain of the Michigan gymnastics team. And so when I lived next to Nick, I did parkour all the time. Um, and you know, when I live next to my friend Max, I do music all the time. Or when I'm with Connor. Um, we become what we surround ourselves with. Yeah, exactly. So I just need to like spend more time with people who do those things. I want to tell one more story, please. So we talked about the tree of knowledge Mm. and the mental model model of the universe. And we also talked about religion and only accepting things from first principles. And I kept thinking to myself, man, there's all these miracles, but I've never seen a miracle before. How can I believe they're real? Mm. And so let's tie it back together to how learning can help you understand the world. You know, what's really cool. Ben Wilson has a podcast called How to Take Over the World that talks about the lives of the most exceptional people in history, including Alexander the Great. Well, Alexander the Great, my friend, conquered Egypt, and the closest Alexander the Great ever came to dying was in the Red Sea, because the Red Sea has marshes, where as a result of the tides go up and down during the day, and he went hiking with his troop, and he got lost. And all these marshes started to get taller and taller and taller, and their horses got stuck in the marsh, and some of the soldiers died, and he survived. But you know what other moment happened in history around that part of the world where water came from both sides and people died? It's when the Jews escaped Egypt in the Nile River. Wow. And my entire life, I was like, there's no way this dude parted a river with a stick. Well, there is a scientific explanation for every single experience that happens. Um, It's just how you view it. And so how interesting is it that that is something that I consider to be myth Mm. and now I understand why it's there. Wow. That's fascinating. It's just a matter of how much you learn and you don't put it into your framework of what you accept until you have corroborating proof that it's real. 
Yeah. And that's like taking today's information and today's knowledge and implanting even on the past. Now I'm learning not just the future because what we have right now is just one snapshot of the way it is and not necessarily the way it will be or the way it was. Okay. So we got to go back to parkour and, and you biking three miles to go to your gymnasium where you strike a deal with the owner. First of all, how do you find this gym? Second of all, what was the deal you made with the yeah. owner? And and explain the story for people of how you got into parkour and how you got into backflips to begin with. Yeah, for sure. So I love doing backflips. And when I was six, I saw a movie where Jackie Chan did a backflip. And I was like, obviously, I need to learn how to do this. And so I got my mom to sign me up for a thing called capoeira. It's like a Brazilian martial art. And I did that for a little bit. And then I signed up for gymnastics. And then I moved to the United States. And in the US, gymnastics is really expensive. So I couldn't do gymnastics. But every time I saw anyone do a flip, I get so excited. And I go to talk to them and I ask them where they learned. And I did this many, many times until one day I saw this kid do a backflip like, like, like a, a, a long distance away from me, but I could see him across a couple of fences. And I went and I ran and I climbed four fences to get to the playground where this kid was. And I was like, where did you learn how to do that? He told me he went to this rec center, um, 1000 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. And I went and I Googled it and I couldn't find a phone number. I couldn't find hours. I couldn't find anything. But I knew that a rec center existed in this place. So I biked there. It was three, three and a half miles from my house. And it was closed. So a couple of days later, I biked there again. I biked there three, four times. I think the third time it was open. And I went and I talked to the guy who owned it. And um, I didn't have money to, to do this. Um, and so I struck a deal with him. Because he, there were some people who got to come for free, but they were like really good gymnasts. Mm. And I was like, so you're telling me that if I get this good, I can come for free? And he was like, yeah. I was like, cool. Can you give me a list of what I need to do in order to be good? And he was like, okay. You need to do 10 pull-ups. You need to be able to do this. You need to be able to do that. I was like, sounds good. Uh, and like you can come to Open Gym. So I went to Open Gym a bunch of times and I paid for the Open Gym. Um, just like saved up for it. Um, and people would be jumping around and playing and playing dag- tag. No. I have one mission in life and it's to complete this list of 10 things so I can get to come to open gym for free. And I completed those things and then I got to come for free. Um, and then I started training backflips and I learned them from YouTube videos like Juji Mufu uh, back in the day. And I would just drill it and drill it. And there's three things you need to be able to do a good backflip. Uh, you need to overcome the fear. You need to know the technique and you need to have the strength. So I didn't have the strength. I mm. had the ability to overcome the fear. I knew the technique. Um, and so I just drilled it. And I built up my abs, I built up my legs, I built up my shoulders, and I started being able to do it. And initially, I would do it off of a ledge, and then I'd stack a bunch of mats, and then I'd remove the mats until there was one, and then I did it standing, and then I did it off of a round off. And then there were a bunch of other people there who did ninja tag. And finally, I hit all the things so I could go and play tag. And these people, really, what they were doing was parkour. And then I got into parkour from there, and then I wanted to learn how to do a cork, and how to do a webster, and how to do a front flip, and how to do a side flip, and how to do a back full. And I just fell in love with it. And it's just such an incredible sport. It's fascinating to me because what most people I think actually do is they look at the full domain and they say, oh, that looks too scary. I don't want to go to the gym. People, It's too complicated. What you did, which was different, you said, I like that one thing. I'm going to get good at that one thing, which can easily let you do the other things as well. It's like if you see someone do pull-ups and you think that's really cool, just try to do pull-ups maybe. Maybe that's the answer. Right. And do you think you've done that in other parts of your life as well? Oh, of course. I mean, I did it with computer science too. So like I really wanted to be able to make iPhone apps. And when I started with computers, it was very scary to me. And I remember like I couldn't hang in the intro computer science class when I was a freshman. And I, my brother was really good at computer science. Mm. But I would misspell the variables so everything would break. And I was too scared of it. I didn't do it. But then I did eight hackathons in a row, and I won half of them without knowing how to code. I jump on a table, pitch my idea, convince people to work on it with me. I pitch it in the end, and we did well. But then the product never continued to be built because I didn't know how to code, mm. and no one else wanted to keep sweating on them. So I was like, cool, well, I got to learn how to do this. So I signed up for the intro computer science class. Most people took three hours to do the first assignment. It took me 15 hours, maybe 18 hours, wow. because I would misspell everything. Right. So, and if you misspell the variable one way here and another way here, it breaks. And IDEs at the time, Sublime did not have spell check. So, what I would do is I would go to the dining hall. I'd take a bag of bread. I'd make it into eight peanut butter sandwiches. I'd walk to the computer science lab at like eight, nine in the morning and I'd sit there and I just code. Code, 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 eat a peanut butter sandwich, code, 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 another peanut butter sandwich. I'd fall asleep, I'd wake up, code, 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 and then I'd go home at like midnight. And I did this. Why every day. were you so obsessed? 
oh, I knew that I needed to get good at this. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do the things I wanted. Mm. So I had built like a 3D printed skateboard break at a payments company and a discount pro- program and like a, a, a cell phone radiation shield that will block your reproductive organs from getting radiation from your phone. Wow. And like all the and like, like a, a cannon that you could shoot as a fire department to choke the air from around the house so that the fire would die. Um, all like physical products. And I was studying you know, renewable energy nuclear hydro solar but then i like i i wanted to make apps because i knew that they were great mm. and so i started studying this and i just i couldn't be the person that i wanted to be if i didn't crack this thing um and so i did maybe a month or two of that and then i started to be able to be debug code really well and then i did you know pretty well in the class and it was funny um we interviewed the tas for the class were amazing amazing and we interviewed one of the tas uh for a role at speechify and he told me, you know, Cliff, uh, I remember you from the class. And I was like, no way you're remembering me from the class. His name is David or David. Um, such a nice person. And he was like, of course I remember you. You were the kid who would show up at two in the morning for office hours. And I was like, well, David, I remember you because you were the TA that was so baller that during your own final period, you stay at two in the morning to give office hours. And you're like, well, I finished my stuff. But you were the kid coming at two in the morning for office hours. It's like game respect game. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, and I remember uh, our final assignment was Pac-Man. Mm. And I built this algorithm, breath first search algorithm for Pac-Man. And uh, I got like some, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me how to build this. And I was like running on very little sleep. And finally I was like, okay, I have like X amount of hours before this is due. I'm going to go sleep. And I went and slept. And in my dream, I solved the bug that I had. I woke up in the morning, I took a shower. And then in the shower, I like really polished off how to fix it. And I took a notebook and I wrote the code on the notebook and I ran to the computer science lab and I implemented it and it worked and I submitted the assignment. And then I got like an 80% instead of a 90%. And I was devastated. And I couldn't believe that I got an 80%. And I asked them, why did I get an 80%? And they showed me what didn't work. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You just looked at the code. You didn't run the program. You docked me points because you believe that it would not work, but I'm telling you it works. So mm-hmm. they ran the program. They ran, I was like, actually, you're right. It does work. You implemented it a different way, but we'll give you the credit. And then I got an answer of getting to be in the class. Um, and so like, that's one. And then I wanted to build iPhone apps. And so I took this course on Udemy by Rob Percival called the complete web developer course, where it's 24 hours of video. You build 19 projects and you build clones of Instagram and Snapchat and Uber and Google maps and like scaled down versions of the apps. And because I saw how he coded, I would then code the same way and I couldn't make a mistake. And I ended up with a folder on my computer with like 19 minimum viable products of these like major apps. And when I wanted to make a new app, I could Frankenstein it together. And like, that was my introduction to computer science. And I was, I just, I wanted to be able to build things. I didn't care about like discrete math or anything like that. I just, I wanted to be able to do the specific stuff that I needed. And that was my exposure to the world. And, you know, people sometimes take a foreign language, Chinese, Latin, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's Latin that you can't even speak Latin, but it makes you think in another way. Chess does the same thing. Computer science really like is more useful than philosophy because you learn mm-hmm. how to think logically. You learn how to think in algorithms. You learn about if statements um, and how to debug something. And a lot of my thinking today is governed by the fact that I spent a lot of time in computer science. Well, what's changed about your worldview from learning computer science? Well, I mean, I'll give you like specific examples. So computer science is all about how do you manipulate data to achieve certain outcomes and objectives? And how do you organize data? So you could put something in a hash map. You could put something in an array. Um, you could make an algorithm. So like uh, last in, first out, breath first search, uh, you know, um, you could write an algorithm for like finding the highest point in a topographical map. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's, there's a logical system for how you do that. Um, and so this is like a classic problem. It's like find the highest point. How do you find the highest point? Uh, well, the best way to do that is drop yourself in a bunch of different points on this map where you don't know how big the map is. And then if you're at a point, there's like six other points around you. Uh, which one is the tallest? Go there. And then which one is the tallest? Go there. And that's how you find the local maxima. But because you drop yourself in a bunch of different places... You can then find the tallest local maxima, that's the global maxima. Mm. And so in life, I always think about global maxima and local maxima. You know, I built this thing with my business, you know, great little text-to-speech iPhone app, but how can I build the global maxima, which would be like an API that's integrated into every website or a Chrome extension. Or, you know, I found like the best friends that I could make in Ranana in Israel or Brown University or in San Francisco, but who are the best friends that I can make in the world? Like, how do I meet those people? Like the global max, the, and so you think about it in the same way that you think about an algorithm. Hmm. Um, or how you like how do you prioritize your tasks? Um, 
And you know, when we talked about like the why, 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 the thing that resonated with me was the idea of let's debug my logic because I know that there can be a bug in there. And so it's all these mental models that you can do. And before computer science, I spent a lot of time on economics. I read so, like Friedrich Hayek and the you know, Hayek, or, or I'd even read like people who I don't agree with, like mm. Karl Marx, Karl Marx, um, you know, the struggle of the proletariat. I think it's like in page eight of his book, there's this one line, whenever one man makes a trade with another, he tells them, I fleece you. As in, in every single transaction, one person is being cheated. But mm -hmm. that's not the case because the world is not a zero-sum game. It is a plus-sum game. And that's language that I picked up from reading On Wealth by Emerson, um, where he talks about the idea that you can apply your thought to matter, rearrange atoms a certain way, and create something that's greater than some of its parts. Um, so if you think about the creation of the steam engine, it was a bunch of like rickety metal parts in someone's garage, and he reorganized them into the steam engine, and you multiply that times a thousand, times a million, and now you can pump water out of the earth you can power a train, you can create electricity. Um, in, in economics, we call that shifting the PPF curve to the right. And you can think about, you know, what's a gift and good? What's diminishing marginal returns? Like all these frameworks for how to think about the world. Um, you know, if you talk about going back to, you know, even Austrian school of economics, uh, one man cannot put all the knowledge of the economy in his head at once. And you can't have all the temporal and local knowledge that you would have as a merchant inside of that specific trade. And that's why having one secretary in communism try to organize the entire economy just doesn't work. Well, and no that, one knows how to do a pencil is an example from Tim Urban, I believe. Yeah. Who is incredible. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. no that's a great example, right? Um, and, and you also don't know the demand. And this is why economics and laissez faire economics works really well. Obviously, you want some checks and balances. And that's why in Speechify, like, I have eight amazing leaders who work with me in the company. And I don't presume to tell them how to do their job. You just tell me what's the biggest, most ambitious thing that you can do. And I will run through walls to make sure that you're unblocked. Um, and I don't micromanage it to anyone. And that's why in the company, like, I don't manage anyone. I lead people. And I lead them by saying, hey, here's the big objective that we have. I will supply all the resources. I will support you. I will teach you. I will help you. I will learn with you. Um, and, and that's how we will accomplish this goal together. Um, but I don't presume to know everything that you, that, that you know as an expert in your field. And by the way, that's something that you get from having a learning difference. You know, dyslexia, ADHD, mm -hmm. what have you. Like, I grew up not being the best computer science person, not being the person who could read the book, not being the person who could spell and so I do believe that other people are very, very smart in some areas, much smarter than me. And so that belief that you're not the best at everything is very key to being able to delegate and lead people well. Um, yeah. It, it's funny because in some sense, I'm listening to you and I'm saying, wow, this guy is so smart, but I love how you're able to say, look, I wasn't that at some oh, point yeah. as well. And that's very inspiring. And going back to Hassan, it's low status, right? Of like, mm. look, I wasn't always like this. And and it's cool to hear about all the ways you've built yourself. The problem with that, though, is you're identifying a place where I'm showing low status, but now you know that I'm smart. Like, it's not a... It's helpful it's not for somebody, be as, a, as somebody who feels as if they're not at, that, at your level yet. So that's the thing I love to do. I love to, uh, I love to point back to like, here's where I was. Yeah. So like, you, by the way, all these like situations of people thinking there's like an overnight success. Oh my God. Mark Zuckerberg came up with Facebook and he became a billionaire overnight, bro. Mark Zuckerberg was like building the internal infra system for his dad's like dentist office when he was 12. Mark Zuckerberg got offered a million dollar offer to buy his like music sharing business when he was in high school yeah. before he even started at Harvard. Like there were so many reps before Facebook even came around. Um, I built 36 products before I even started on Speechify. So on that topic, I have this theory that I want to ask you about. It's that people at similar time frames of their journey connect with other people in different fields of their journey. Mm -hmm. The reason why you and Mr. Beast are connecting in this moment is because you both have been working on your thing, obsessing over it for 10 years. And now you're able to look at each other yeah. and be like, oh, that's one of me. I see you. Whereas... If you were in year five, you'd find other people in year five of their own journey. I find that with the podcast. I'm in totally. year two. So I'm seeing people on year two of their own journey and being like, oh, that's cool. And when someone on year 10 or above helps me out, I'm like, wow, I really appreciate that because you don't need to do that. You, right. Have you sensed that or felt that? Oh, throughout absolutely. A hundred percent. In different fields all the time. And in our field too. Um, I always seek to learn from people who who are ahead of me. Like that's of like one of my favorite things to do. And you know, you grow in pods. So, you know, we, we connected as a result of my friend Valentin and you know, Valentin's younger than me by a year and a half, but he is you know, the most amazing human being. He's on a very similar journey as I am. 
Uh, same thing for my brother Tyler, Chai Tu, who leads products, Simon, who leads operations at Speechify, Pankaj, who leads finance, um, all throughout the company, uh, Rajiv, who leads our you know uh, engineering team. So absolutely. And I think that in life, you just want to be the best person that you can be. Um, and then, you know, pour as love much, as much love as you can into other people. Um, but you can't improve if you don't have something to work against. It's like you're a sword. You want to sharpen the sword. You have to sharpen it against a rock. Mm. You need some challenge. So Jimmy had this challenge with YouTube. You know, he didn't have any money. He saved $1 a day for 30 days to buy a microphone, right? And he would like skip class to edit videos on his laptop in his car. Um, very similar to me making peanut butter sandwiches videos and like learning computer science. Um, and when you see someone else who's so ambitious, it, it shows you that things are possible. So I'll give you an example. Um, when um, Logan, Paul, and I did a bunch of adventures together over COVID, um, and I remember we were driving to his ranch, and it came in conversation that I believe I'm going to live to 200. And he's like, what? I was like, yeah. I was like, I also think that. I've never met anybody else who also thought that. Well, it turns out Mr. Beast also thinks he's going to live to 200. <laughs> of course. It's like all these people who have experienced the impact of being extremely tenacious and resourceful, they buy into the idea that like this is totally possible. Totally po- It makes sense. And why do I say it makes sense? Because I read the primary sources. I read the literature. I did the science. I did the experiments. I thought about it. I talked to experts. And it just makes sense when you consider the rest of my mental model of the universe. I can't guarantee that we live to 1,000 given all the data that I have. But 200... I feel it's I feel it's a sure bet. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's funny you bring up Logan Paul because that's one thing that I wanted to talk to you about. You used his horse for some ad or something. Explain how that story went down. Sure. So I, in 2020, in the beginning of the year, Speechify was starting to do really well. Uh, a lot of people were using it. They were paying for the product and I wanted to figure out how to grow faster. And so what I did is I made a list of the top 100 best performing consumer subscription companies in the world. And I messaged every CEO, every head of growth, every CMO, I made a Google sheet. Uh, I put their emails, their LinkedIn's, their Instagram's, their Facebook's, and I messaged every single one. And if they didn't respond, I messaged again. And then I got on a Zoom call with them. And then I'd fly to wherever they were in the world. i go to Denmark, i go to Israel, i go to China, uh, i go to San Francisco or Boston or LA, and I'd sit behind them in their office and I'd saw how they bought ads. I got really good at buying ads. And then I wanted to make YouTube ads. And so I was like, cool, well, if I'm going to make the content, let me go talk to people who are creating on YouTube. And so I got connected with Omar from Yes Theory, who became one of my best friends. Um, and basically, I moved to LA, and like three different people were like, you know who you remind me of? You remind me of this guy, Omar. So eventually, we met up. It was the same wavelength. Um, and I started meeting more and more YouTubers as a result of just like going to events. Um, and I met Logan, and we like instantly connected. Actually, the way, the way we met was... I post, so I started recreating the best ads I'd ever seen because mm. YouTube requires not user generated content, but like more fleshed out content, co- content. And so I made like the Dollar Shave Club ad and I wanted to make the Old Spice commercial and a bunch more. And so it was Old Spice, okay, he had a horse and I, I needed a horse. So I posted on Instagram, hey, anybody have a friend with a horse? And then a couple of people responded and one of them was um, a Mark connected me to Logan. And then I went to his house and we chatted and we were in the same moment in our journeys in different fields. Mm. We instantly connected. We became really good friends. Around that time, I had injured my shoulders. He, inj- I had injured my shoulder from parkour. Uh, actually, it was not from parkour. It actually, it was from basketball. <laughs> I'd injured my sh- shoulder in basketball. He injured his, uh, his heel. And so we started going to PT together every day. Mm. And then, you know, we did a bunch of other adventures. And so he was like, yeah, of course you can use my horse. And I went to his ranch and he helped me like direct this ad that ended up did re- doing really well. Um, and if you search on YouTube, you know, uh, Cliff Weitzman speech- speechify horse, you probably find this ad. Um, yeah. We'll put it below for sure, sure as well. But does it ever stop you as like, I didn't even, English isn't even my first language. And here I am hanging out with the biggest celebrities in the world and doing, all, is this, was this part of the vision always or what was the vision and did it, how different is reality yeah. today than what you expected when you were a little kid? Uh, celebrity doesn't factor into it. Mm. Um, it's about making friends. So yeah. we talked about the global maxima. I found all the people like, so I got to Brown. Why did my cheeks start hurt from, hurting so much? It's because I realized that the academics were not the important thing. Mm. It was the people, right? First year, I didn't do the computer science thing. I did the second year. The first year and the beginning of every single semester, every single semester for eight semesters and then a couple of semesters even after I graduated, I go to the dining hall, 
I grab a plate, I go to sit with a table with seven people I didn't know. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'd be the eighth person. I'd be like, hey, is anyone sitting here? No? Hey, what's your name? I'm Cliff. Nice to meet you. Can I sit here? Sweet. And then I get to know the entire table. And then I go grab another plate, and I sit with another seven people I didn't know, and I grab a cup of tea, and I sit with another seven people I didn't know. So I got to know the majority of my grade within the first month of school. And I did this every year with the freshmen and with seniors. And so I just got to know all of Brown, and then I ended up with a really amazing friend group. And then I moved to San Francisco after my visiting scholar year, and it was, it was rough because I wasn't working at Google. I wasn't working at Uber. I wasn't working at Facebook. I didn't have friends as a result of my work. And the only people working with me were people who I hired, and it was not a lot of people. And so what I ended up doing is every month or two, I'd fly back to Brown, and I'd crash on Valentin Perez's couch, and I'd go to events, and I'd do stuff, and it was awesome. And I was like, well, how do I make more friends outside of school? And I was like, well, YouTube is great, and I love books, and I like medium, and I like philosophy. And so I started messaging all my favorite authors. Hmm. And whenever I'd see someone do a parkour trick, I'd message them. And I believe, I did a lot of credit card hacking when I was young with points. So I got a lot of points. Um, and I treat the airline system like the subway system. You know this because we planted this podcast at least three separate times in the past. And I ended up being in other places in the world. So I couldn't do it. Um, and so we did it as soon as I got back to New York. Um, but I didn't care where you lived. I wanted to be your friend if you were awesome. Mm. And so I just looked for the most awesome people in the world. So one of the times I didn't make it here was because I was in Salt Lake City with Brandon Sanderson, who wrote my favorite book, um, uh, The Way of Kings. Um, you know, Hassan Minhaj is just like, you know, happened to be in the thing, but like he's, he's an awesome person. So great, I'm gonna be friends with him. Um, you know, Patrick is an amazing person. You don't know who Patrick is, but like I think he's fantastic and I have an amazing relationship with him. Um, and so it's not necessarily people who have celebrity. Right. It's people who are at the same journey, uh, at the same level of the journey as where I am, and I'm inspired by them. Um, and there's musicians that you know people have never heard of, but I saw this one poem that they wrote and I thought it was amazing. Oh my God, there's this one musician that I'm absolutely obsessed with. I think there's like 100 people who listen to him. And I've sent him so many messages to try and get him to respond to me, and I haven't gotten a response back yet. But I will get him eventually. Um, and there's also like founders of companies that nobody knows about the founder. You might even not know about the company, but I've been trying to get to them for ages because they're just so cool, and I think they've built an amazing business, and I want to understand how they did this. You know, How to Take Over the World, the podcast, it's growing, but it's not that popular yet. I don't care if Ben is famous. I care that he listens and reads books that are awesome, and I want to have a conversation with that guy. Um, and yeah, so the vision was to find the most awesome friends in the world and to build real relationships with those people. And that's why the relationships are typically built around, you know, let's book an Airbnb in like uh, the desert. Let's like go play basketball. Let's go, you know, shoot an ad or whatever it might be. Like, let's go to Hamilton. Mm. Um, let's do a weekend, whatever it might be. Let's work on a project together. And often you end up working with people on projects with, with friends. Um, yeah, so the goal was just to find awesome friends. It had nothing, like, I'll give you an example. One of my best friends in London is this guy, uh, Larry, who is the chairman of prêt -à manger which is like the Starbucks of, the, of, of Europe. <laughs> um, amazing company. Um, you have no idea who Larry is, but, like, I love Pret. And so, and this guy is, like, he's, like, a proper, like, adult. He has, like, kids who are in their <laughs> 20s. Uh, but he's awesome, so I'm going to be his friend. That's awesome. Yeah, no, and that I'm really happy you corrected celebrity in my head to awesome people because a lot of times celebrities are awesome people, but a lot of times they're not. So yeah, good. That's what good like correction. if I had like if I could like wish for like one like piece of data is like just help me identify the most awesome people regardless of whether they post about what they do or not. Yes. Like one mental exercise I'll always do is like who are the most awesome couples out there? Mm. Like the best example I have is my parents. And the second best example I have is like Barack and Michelle Obama. Hmm. And then for the longest time, it was like Bill and Melinda Gates and like Jeff and Mackenzie Bezos. And I was devastated when they broke up, both those couples. The problem is I don't have any examples of people who are not famous. Like my friend Connor and his wife Brianna are amazing people. Like I'm such a fan of their relationship. And um, I can think of other couples who are amazing, but like I wish I knew more. Mm. It's just that I only know about the ones that are public. Yeah, and I think that's why dating information gets so well seen in the public eyes because mm. people are looking for that inherently, that feeling of love mm -hmm. and being understood. Being but understood. That's, that's, that's what it all comes yeah. down. That's what we're seeking in a dating partner mm. is to really feel like someone else knows us as well as we know ourselves. That is one thing. Definitely. So the thing that I seek other than that is I want you to help me grow. 
Like, I want to be a better person by virtue of spending all my time with you. Mm. And so, you know, the saying, you are the average of your five best friends, this is true. But what people don't realize is that statement is exponential. The person who you spend the most time with in number one position is hypothetically more important than the other four positions. Mm. And so your partner, who you spend the majority of your time with, is the person that changes you the most. And so you got to make sure that you're changing in the way that you want to change. What would you tell somebody then who's in a relationship where it's good, but it's not great? What do you tell that person? Well, number one, it's really important to um, shout out to, wait, I'm bad with names. Same with our friend who I had dinner with. It was Matt, Valentin, and? Elliot Choi. Elliot Choi. All right. So shout out to Elliot Choi who taught me this line, um, which is you got to choose that person. Mm. Um, and so that's it. Like, can this be a person that you're with for life? And if so, do you want to choose them? And if you want to choose them, that's what makes that relationship amazing. Um, and so that's the place where you need to make the choice. And once you make the choice, it's up to you to make that relationship work. Um, I, I, my experience is most humans are amazing. Mm. Women are even more amazing than men in many ways, most ways. Um, and so just choose to make that work. Um, and then, you know, each person has their own quirks their own things that they're interested in, their own affinities, how they grew up, what their family is like, what their culture is like. Try to find a match. Find someone who has a similar goals in life. You know, for me, my joy comes from, I want to have seven kids. Um, Why seven? I'm one of five and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I think that if my parents had seven, it would have been even more wonderful. Do I think I could deal with eight? Maybe, actually. So I'm open to eight. <laughs> you could be convinced. Ten is probably, ten is probably a lot. Uh, but seven or eight, I would definitely do. Well, it's funny. This is one thing about you. It's such a long-term planner. What do you do when your long-term plans get disrupted in some way? Great question. So I wanted to have $10 million, but actually I wanted to have $10 million by the time I was 20, 20. And then I thought I'd be a billionaire by the time I graduated college. And neither one of those things <laughs> happened. Surprise. Um, and I was like, God damn it. Like <sighs> Bill Gates dropped out by the time he was in sophomore year. Mark Zuckerberg dropped out by the time he was in sophomore year. Evan Spiegel dropped out sophomore year. Tyler Weitzman dropped out sophomore year. What am I doing, man? I was very disappointed in myself. But then I was like, cool, well, we raised that goal. There's no points crying over spilled milk. All right, I won't do it by the time I'm 20. I'll do it by the time I'm 22. Mm. That's probably the camera dying. So one second, let me reset it. Mike is yours. Go ahead. So one thing I wanted to talk to you about was your email to Dan Katz. Okay, great topic. Yeah. How do you come across Dan Katz? you were talking before about how you broke things down, how you, you will email people, how the spreadsheets work. Mm -hmm. Why Dan Katz? What do you say to him? And how do you guys become friends? Right. So this is also a classic example of it's not people with celebrity. It's people who are awesome. Yes. Um, when I was 21, I was graduating college. And I wrote a 30-page paper about my worldviews. And the conclusion of the paper... Um, you know, you know I, I, I broke it down into the 18 things I believe that nobody else believed. Mm -hmm. uh, love is the most important thing in life, and the more you give of it, the more you have to give. My top goals in life are to be the best person that I can and, um, and have kids who are greater than me. Then it's to have as much love in my life, whether it be with my family, my friends, my significant others, but the world, give love. Uh, and then elevate the collective quality of life. And I'll do that in the short term probably by creating tech companies and long term by um, you know, mentoring and I wrote the final paragraph. And in the beginning of this 30 page paper, I wrote about my life, who I am when I was a kid. And I wrote a lot about dyslexia and being bullied and not figuring things out. And you know, it's funny, I never had a real insecurity, but I knew who I wanted to be. At the time I wanted to be a billionaire, prime minister of Israel and a pop star all at the same time. And I knew that I would not be able to do those things if I wasn't able to read. And I would practice reading all the time and I would fall asleep in the book in the public library all the time. Library, librarians would wake me up. And the conclusion to the, my essay was, imagine if one of those times that eight-year-old Cliff was asleep in the book, he had a dream that he could, that he could read, that he could read books about how to overcome his social troubles with bullying. You know, maybe he could find a book about how to win friends, that he could read books about how to build muscle and be bigger and be good at sports for our body. If you could read books about how to understand happiness, predictably irrational, uh, you know, that could be key ethics by Aristotle, um, thus spoke Zarathustra. If you could read books about history and great people who came before, 
you know, rappers and artists and athletes and business people and inventors. Imagine if you told Cliff, eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, that he would be able to read when he was older. Not only that, he'd go to college. Not only that, he'd graduate with a really high GPA and he'd go to Brown. I don't think he'd believe you. And so I cried when I wrote that final paragraph. And I finished the essay, I opened up my email, and I started writing thank you notes, right? Lying on the grass saying thank you. Thank you to the universe. I wrote a thank you note to my parents. I wrote a thank you note to my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Bloom. I wrote a thank you notes to Mark Reisler, who was my academic workshop TA, who would read over my essays in high school when I had spelling mistakes. Who, when I got rejected from AP European history because I had spelling mistakes, would sit with me every lunch and tell me the story of American history because there was no audiobook for that thing. And then I took the test and got a five. I wrote thank you notes to my next door neighbors who lent me books, who taught me how to play basketball, who let me use their trampoline when there wasn't a gym around. And the list would not have been completed without one person. And so I Googled his email. I f couldn't find it, so I guessed it. I guessed like eight variations. And so I emailed myself, and then I put the eight variations in BCC. This guy is Don Katz. Don Katz is the founder of Audible. And it used to be that when I wanted to read books, I would go on Pirate Bay and I would torrent them because it was the only way to get books. And then I found Audible. And Audible changed my life because it made it easier to get books. And I listened to not just Harry Potter, but Percy Jackson and Narnia and Atlas Shrugged and Game of Thrones and the Bible and the four hour work week. And I would walk into Barnes and Nobles when it used to exist. And I would take pictures of the book covers and I would go home and I would download all the books on Audible. And the email started, hey, you don't know me, I don't know you, but you changed my life. And I just graduated college and I sent thank you notes to all the people who were most impactful on me and the list would not be complete without you. And it was a long email, at least eight paragraphs. And an hour and a half later, I had an email back in my inbox. Dear Cliff, emails like this don't make my weeks, but my months and my years. And he wrote me back a longer email than the one that I wrote him about how his daughter also had a learning difference. And it's part of why he ended up starting Audible. And people told her that she would not be able to read. And now she's you know, an extremely successful person. Um, and so you know, we met later and he is someone I tremendously admire. I remember one of the phone calls I had with him, I was actually, um, many years later, I was sleeping over at Amar's house from yesterday and I was nervous for the call. And I was explaining that like, to me, if I had a call with LeBron, with LeBron or with Don Katz, Don Katz is much more impactful for me than LeBron is, as much as I love LeBron. Um, and the crazy part is I get those exact emails at least 10 times a day at this point, mm -hmm. right? Speechify has more than 23 million users. There's 200,000 five-star reviews. It's typically the number one app in its app store category. And people listen to 6.5 billion words a month. Divide 6.5 billion by 50,000, which is the number of words in Harry Potter. So people are listening to more Harry Potters. Than, like, if I wanted to do all this reading, I would need to not sleep, not eat, not go to the bathroom and duplicate myself 10,000 plus times. Um, Audible has 450,000 books. There's 100 million books who have been published. You can read all of them with Speechify, plus all your emails and your PDFs and the New York Times and Medium and every handout that's given to you in class. Um, so that was my email to Don Katz. It's so remarkable that, like you drew the connection just now, the thing that helped you so much, you're now doing such a similar thing for the entire web. And it is so, it gives me chills to think about and to sit here and, and to know that the the problem you faced and that the thing that you solved was also the thing that other people you were helping solve that problem as well. And just such a beautiful full circle moment. And I mean, it is where the proper place to close a, a beautiful podcast like this. But before we do, I'd like to ask you to give a challenge to people. Mm. 
you are somebody who's inspirational, you're intelligent, you're, you're willing to think about the world in a different way. And I'd be curious if you just had a challenge for anybody listening who got this far in the podcast and what you would challenge them to do. Um, so I'll put one ideological and one practical. Um, sometimes people ask if you were to make a poster and change one thing about the world, what would it be? Mm. The one thing I change about the world is I want every person in the world to be able to wake up in the morning, look themselves in the mirror and say, I'm awesome. I can do anything. So I challenge you to figure out how you can get to that state. The first thing is just manifest every morning, look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm awesome. I can do anything. I'm beautiful. I'm smart. I'm intelligent. I'm capable. When I was in those computer science classes and I was scared about them, I had a notebook and I would write every single morning. I'm good at computer science. I'm good at computer science. I'm good at computer science. Chills. And every single night before I go to school to sleep, I'd write, I'm good at computer science. I'm good at computer science. I'm good at computer science. And when I would code, I would listen to that song by Katy Perry. Maybe the reason why all the doors are closed is one that opens that leads you to the perfect world. And I would listen to nonstop from Hamilton. And I power through. So what's the thing that you're scared of? Get a notebook and write three times in the morning, three times in the evening. I will be strong. I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna up that challenge. I'll diet better, whatever it might be. Yeah. I'm gonna say at least ten times in morning and night. That's, 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 that's deep. You know, I'm going to leave to 200. I'm going to live to 200. Whatever it is, I'm going to build a billion dollar company. Right? I'll get straight A's this year. I'll quit. I'll quit smoking weed. Mm. Right? I'll start going to sleep on time. Whatever it might be. The thing that you believe that you may be in the back of your head, you don't believe you can, just write it out. You'll succeed. All right. That's the, the ideological one. The practical one, easiest one. Download Speechify. Um, and I challenge you to learn how to listen up to 500 words per minute. Mm. So people don't realize this, but like you start elementary school and you listen to a normal, like no one expects you to read fast first, second, third, fourth year of elementary school. We expect that it take 10 years. Listening is the same way. You got to practice. And if you practice, I've seen across the board, I've never seen it not happen. Everybody is not good at listening the first book they listen to or the second or the third. It takes 10 books to get good at listening. What does good at listening means? It means you can listen at not only 1x, but 1.5 or 2x. You can drive while you're listening at the same time and you still retain well and you can, you know, do other things, have come and still enjoy the book. Mm. Um, 10 books. So that's what it takes. And the thing is, as you practice, you start being able to listen fast. And so the way to do that is listen to your podcast at 1.25 X speed, download video speed controller and use it on YouTube to up the speed by 0.1 increments, or just listen to YouTube at like 1.25, 1.5 X speed, but download Speedify, the Chrome extension and the iPhone app and try to not listen to 200 words per minute, try to listen to 300. And then activate the automatic speed ramping algorithm, which would automatically increase your speed until you get to 500 and learn how to listen at that speed. And if you're curious, if you're curious, how does a kid who is 28 years old with dyslexia read 1,500 books? It's because I don't listen at 1x speed and I don't read at 200 words per minute, which is the average reading speed. I listen at 750 words per minute. And I do it when I'm biking, when I'm eating, when I'm riding my longboard, when I'm going to the bathroom, when I'm working out. And that's how I finish two books a week. So that's my challenge to you. That's it. At Cliff Weitzman, wherever you follow on social media platforms. Thank you so much for coming here, Cliff. Thank You're you, an absolute legend. I appreciate you so much. My pleasure to be here.